All right. Let's find our seats. <laughs> Israel, if you want to call it that. And uh, it was over within, really, honestly, it was over within a few hours. Um, and over, when I say that it was over, what I mean is, is that Iran had fired all the drones and missiles um, that it wanted to currently. And Israel, along with the United States and France and Jordan and Great Britain, and as it turns out, Saudi Arabia, um, shot down around 99% of everything that was you know, sent their way. It was perfectly choreographed. Um, there was 185 drones, there was 36 cruise missiles, there was 110 ballistic missiles shot at Israel, and short of 10 ballistic missiles that made it into Israeli airspace, the rest of everything was shot down before it even got near Israel. Um, there was not a single UAV, which is a drone, um, or a cruise missile that entered uh, Israeli territory. All the alarms that were triggered in Israel were triggered because of ballistic missiles. And there were a couple of ballistic missiles that fell at one of the uh, military bases that did a little bit of damage um, for Israel, but it was up and operational within hours after it hit. And they sent out pictures of their airplanes landing and, and stuff like that, you know, thumbing their nose at Iran. Nice try. Um, and so it was so quick. It was like it started and it was over so fast. Uh, we kind of think, oh, well, it's like no big deal. Is that all you have, right? Is that all you have, Iran? But that was all uh, that they agreed to do. And when I say they agreed to do, you have to kind of understand that this whole thing was put together between the Iran and U.S. and a lot of the uh, uh, surrounding nations to look like a really nice attack on Israel so Iran could have their retaliation. Um, they cleared the airspace. They cleared the borders. They... they, they cleared the, the flight pass, you know, for the missiles. Um, and then they got approval. Iran got approval from the United States so that they could attack Israel. And then the United States went around and helped Israel defend uh, against the missiles. And then after it was all done, a couple hours later, two or three hours later, after the first uh, missiles were launched, then Biden contacted Netanyahu and told him, listen, you don't retaliate. We, we won't support you if you retaliate. And Netanyahu said, well, let's go back to bed, right? So, um, and they're planning their retaliation. We don't know what it'll look like or what Israel's going to do, but you don't fire, you know. The Iran has said clearly that they want to, uh, you know, destroy Israel. And, uh, and you don't send that many missiles uh, to Israel and not expect a retaliation. Right? It's going to happen. Anyway, it's all politics. And uh, so, yeah, so Israel's going to respond, but they haven't responded as of yet. They're planning it from what I read this morning. They're, uh, they're in that mode right now. So continued prayers for Israel because it's not over. We know it's not over. Why? Because we have God's word and we know what God's word says and how the other nations are going to treat Israel. But we should also know, as it says in Psalms 121.4, which is, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And uh, so Israel is protected by God. So we're going to be in John 10 this morning. We're going to go John 10, verses 1 through 21. We're going to be talking about shepherds and sheep. And it does apply to what we saw with Israel um, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of people who think that they're leaders and shepherds. They aren't really doing a really good job at shepherding politically speak, speaking. So we're going to be talking about shepherds and sheep, talking about the good shepherd, the one shepherd we should follow, the only shepherd we should follow, Jesus. What do you call a sheep thief? Anybody? Steal wool. <laughs> What's a sheep's favorite car? Come on, nobody? Come on. A Lamborghini. Uh. <laughs> what happens if you're surrounded by a flock of sheep? 
you get lambushed. <laughs> lambushed, right? Speaking of being lambushed, I did some research and I wanted to show a video that I thought, let's see if I can get this to work, that I thought uh, was a really good behind the scenes picture of what it's like to shepherd sheep, not just literally shepherd sheep, but also from sort of a, you know, a pastoral leadership overseer type of ministry, you know, idea. So you can get the idea. This is what it's like. My remote's not working here, but this is what it's like, right? So this is a really in-depth, it's really quick, like 40 some odd seconds, in-depth, behind the scenes documentary uh, kind of thing picture, a picture into the world of what it's like to shepherd speak, bo- shepherd sheep, both literally, figuratively, metaphorically, however you want to <laughs> phrase it. Watch this really quick. So you understand, (laughs) that's what it's like shepherding. That's the truth of ministry right there. (laughs) So let's read John chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all out, all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd and who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. And many of them said, he is a demon, he's insane, why listen to him? And others said, these are not the words of one who was oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you'll speak it to us this morning. I pray that your words be spoken, and I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are the good shepherd and that you do know us. You know us by name, and we know know you. We know your voice, and when you call us, we follow and we listen. So I pray, Lord, we continue to do that. Listen to the voice of the good shepherd, not to all those who are trying to enter the pen in some other way, who have come in under false pretenses. They're not shepherds at all, Jesus said, regardless of what they call themselves. They're thieves and robbers who only are looking to steal, kill, and destroy. So we pray, Lord, we can just continue to listen to you, listen to your word, and follow you. 
We thank you for this. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to talk about sheep and shepherding this morning. The first thing you have to understand is something that you may not really like is the fact that you are sheep. Because we live in a world that tells you not to be a sheep, right? I mean, it's, I see it all the time. Don't be a sheep, right? From all sides. Everyone uses the expression, you know, you know you'll have the, the liberals saying, don't be a sheep to the conservatives, and the conservatives saying, don't be a sheep to the liberals, and everyone goes back and forth with the phrase, don't be a sheep, right? All sides of the political arena, everyone, don't be a sheep, don't be a sheep. But guess what? You're a sheep. They're a sheep too, whether they want to admit it or not, right? They'll tell you, be a lion instead, right? Be a lion, don't be a sheep. Because that, that term today, it's, it's derogatory. Right? Don't be a sheep in a world full of wolves. Don't be a sheep. So they'll tell you that phrase. They'll say that to encourage. Right? Basically what they're trying to do is to encourage you to think for yourself. Because if you're a sheep, you must not be thinking for yourself. You're just following the flock, right? So they're like, we don't want you to blindly follow others without question, right? So think for yourselves. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the brainwashed multitudes. You must be brainwashed if you're a sheep. Don't be a sheep. Be a person who's thoughtful. Be a person who's sensible, aware, focused. Be a person who's, you know, not afraid of taking independent actions based on your own analysis. Because obviously sheep can't do that. Or so they say. It's not true. but Because right? what they're implying is then, therefore, is that someone who's a sheep is not intellectual. Right? Someone who's a sheep is, you know, you don't have a balanced perception on life. You, you don't use reasoning. You're not aware of things. You don't have any intuition. You don't have any wisdom to make decisions. You're just following the flock. You're just following the flock. So if, if, if you're a sheep... You're basically just dumb and stupid. So don't be a sheep. That's what they tell you. And it sounds good. I mean, if you, you know, weren't viewing it for, through a biblical lens, if you weren't viewing it through the word of God, it sounds good. Don't be a sheep. Right? You know, get put on a t-shirt. Don't be a sheep. Except the Bible says you're a sheep. And like I said, they're sheep too. Even though they're telling you not to be sheep, they just don't understand. Right? Those are world standards. Those aren't God's standards. Because <clears throat> whether you like it or not, God says you're a sheep. And with that comes a warning. And that's kind of what we're seeing here in the chapter here. Because remember, Jesus is in the middle of a discussion with some Pharisees, with some religious leaders. At the end of chapter 9, they heard him speaking to the blind man. And they said, listen, are, are we blind? They weren't really sincerely asking the question. They knew, of course, they weren't physically blind. But, you know, they're speaking s spiritually. Oh, are we blind? We're, we're the religious, you know, we're leaders here in Jerusalem. We're, are we blind? And Jesus says, well, if you were blind, you'd have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. He's telling them, listen, because you think you have sight, because you think you understand the ways of God, because you represent God, but yet you deny me. Yes, you are absolutely blind. So as he's continuing this conversation with the religious leaders, the very next thing he tells them is this, and this is the warning that comes with it. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but comes in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Who's he speaking to? The religious leaders. Who's he calling a thief and a robber? The religious leaders. Okay? Because here's the truth. The Bible says you're a sheep. Truth about sheep is that they need shepherds, okay? Sheep needs shepherds. It's a scientific, proven fact. Sheep want somebody to follow. And if you don't have a shepherd out there leading them, what the sheep will do is they will pick another sheep in the flock, and they'll be like, hey, Joe, it's your turn to lead today, right? And they'll just follow whatever <laughs> sheep they think is the leader, regardless of where that sheep is going. They, they need shepherds. So th if we're sheep, the question for us is, 
well, what shepherd are we following? Because sheep are following a shepherd. For good or bad, for better or worse, sheep are following a shepherd. Or, or they're lost sheep. Okay? Now, don't be scared by the fact that there are lost sheep. All right? I mean, sheep like to wander. Sheep are notoriously dependent animals that, and the reason they need a shepherd is because they need constant tending. They're wanderers. It's their nature. Even in the best and the safest of places, places that provide ample protection for them, places that give them water and food, sheep are known to wander off and get lost. Right? And sometimes, of course, when they wander off, they get eaten by predators because they wandered away from the flock. But lost sheep aren't a problem for Jesus. That's, a matter of fact, exactly why he's here. Here's the truth about sheep. Often sheep are referred to as stupid. The world wants you to think sheep are stupid, so therefore don't be a sheep. Sheep can't think for themselves. Sheep can't reason for themselves. Sheep can't do all this stuff. They're just, you know, following the crowd, going with all the rest of the sheep. But it's not true. Sheep aren't stupid. Sheep are actually incredibly intelligent. Sheep have an impressive memory. Sheep have incredible recognitions, recogni you know, recognition skills. They can recognize up to 50 other sheep faces and remember them for two years. They can also recognize human faces. This is how they know their shepherd. They build friendships. They stick to one another in fights, right? They headbutt shepherds, you know, as a group, right, if they need to. They also feel sad. They feel emotions. They get depressed, especially when other sheep, their friends, are led off to slaughter. Right? So they experience emotions, fear, anger, rage, despair, boredom, all the things that we feel, sheep feel. They're incredibly intelligent. But all that being said, sheep aren't really known for like being deep thinkers. Right? Because when you think of a sheep, they're very content in just being in a field, eating grass, and following their shepherd. They're fine with that. But sometimes, and this is the truth about sheep, sometimes they get so busy grazing that they don't even pick up their head to see where the rest of the flock has gone. And before they know it, the flock has wandered off, and they're left behind. Well, the flock, and, that's, and this is how they get lost. This is how they get in danger. This is how they get separated from the flock. This is why they need a shepherd. They need a shepherd to be like, hey, we left one behind. We need to go get him. He was so busy eating over there, he wasn't paying attention that we've moved or that we're moving. But not just any shepherd. They need a shepherd that's going to look out for them. They need a shepherd that's not going to abandon them. They need a shepherd that's not going to lead them into danger. They need a shepherd who's willing to keep an eye on them and doesn't just let them wander off. Because if you could imagine... If a shepherd just gets his flock and goes, and he realizes only half his flock came with him, and he's like, where's the other half? Oh, def I don't know. I don't care. If they, if they can't bother to follow, what good are they? Well, what kind of shepherd is that? Right? Back in 2005, I mean, it's almost been 20 years ago, there was a group of shepherds in eastern T Turkey who were so busy with breakfast one morning, they weren't paying attention to their sheep, and they had 1,500 sheep walk off a cliff. 450 of the sheep died. That's the first 450 that went over the, the cliff. The others landed on top of them. That's why they didn't die. Don't want to make a joke out of it, but that's, you know, <laughs> they got a good bounce. But the sheep were just following the lead sheep. See, sheep have lead sheep. If there isn't a shepherd to lead them, they have a lead sheep. And if that lead sheep goes somewhere, they just follow the lead sheep. And the shepherds were so busy with breakfast, they paid no attention. They didn't realize what their sheep were doing, and 1,500 of those sheep just walked right off a cliff. So I'm going to reiterate what we said. We're sheep. Is any of this relatable yet? <laughs> right? We are sheep. And we're following a shepherd, good or bad, for better or worse. We're following a shepherd, or we are lost sheep. It tells us in Isaiah 53, 6, that 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Or in 1 Peter chapter 2, it tells us that we were straying like sheep. We wander off like sheep. We get lost like sheep. Well, the good news is, as I said, is Jesus. Right? Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He came specifically for that reason. Not just the lost sheep of Israel, but he just says right here when what we read this morning that uh, there are others in the, that will be in the fold, referring to the Gentiles as well. So Jesus has compassion on those who are lost. And as he refers to them in Matthew chapter 9, he says they are what? They are sheep without a shepherd. The lost are sheep without a shepherd. And who's come to bring them back, to find them, to seek them out? It's the good shepherd, right? Jesus. So in these verses that we're reading here this morning, what we're seeing is Jesus telling us, telling the religious leaders why he is the good shepherd. And quite frankly, why they are not. Right? And he gives us these qualifications of what it is to be a good shepherd. Right? Jesus is the best shepherd. He's the only shepherd that we should follow. There are no other shepherds that we should be following. If you're following any other shepherds, you're following a wrong shepherd. Too many people are following wrong shepherds because they aren't following Jesus. But he's going to give us these qualifications of being a good shepherd, qualifications that only Jesus meets. And when we measure other shepherds by these same qualifications, they're going to pale in comparison, obviously. No one can measure up. Because this is Jesus, and he is the only good shepherd. As a matter of fact, what Jesus tells these religious leaders is basically that they're hirelings. They aren't even shepherds at all. Because they don't care about the flock. And they're really only looking out for themselves. He says, a hireling, if danger comes, as he says here, you, you know, in the, the bottom section, right? He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees. How many times have we seen that? How many times have we seen that in the church? I can think not too long ago there was a large church group in this area called Mars Hill. And when the wolves started coming, what happened to the shepherd? Well, he left. He didn't really even say goodbye. He just hightailed it out of town and opened up another ministry down and took over another ministry down in Arizona. I'm not sure he's ever even apologized. He just left his flock to the wolves. And many of those people in that church in Mars Hill today have left the church. Yeah, many of those families were ripped apart. We know people, we did ministry with people who were in Mars Hill when we were doing apartment ministry through Community Northwest. And a lot of those couples that we did ministry with today are divorced. And they, they went through these struggles after the church collapsed. When you have leaders who are only looking out for themselves and aren't sticking up for the flock and have no desire to protect their flock, and when danger comes, they run, you're leaving your flock to the wolves. And you're not a good shepherd. Jesus is saying here, you're a hireling. You're not even worthy of being called a shepherd. That's what he's telling the religious leaders right here. Right? But first he starts talking about the sheepfold. Right? The very first thing he says in verse 1, and yes, we're just getting to verse 1. Don't worry, we'll get through it. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the by the door, but climbs in by another way. That man's a thief and a robber. Now, so what Jesus is saying, listen, there's a sheepfold. Now, you're like, maybe you're like, what's a sheepfold? Right? But a sheepfold is, it's basically a shelter for the sheep, right? It's just a pen. But you remember, um, they're, the sheep and the, and the uh, shepherd, they're on the road a lot. They're, you know, they're out in the field. What, Hudson? Yeah. No, you're good. Yeah. They're out in the field. 
And, and they, don't all, they don't have portable pins they take with them, right? Remember, remember when your kids were younger and you're traveling around, you had that little pin that could fold up and you had the little straps and you could carry it with you wherever you went. We had them, right? And we'd just go and we could pop it open and snap it together wherever we were and put the kid in the middle on their blankie with their stuffed toy or whatever and you could leave them. And they're good, right? You could carry your pin with you. But the shepherds didn't have a pin they carried with them, right? But a sheepfold was actually more of a pin that was near a town, and what it was is that if the, if the shepherd came to town with his sheep, like the, the shepherd had to go in, you know, there was a great deal at Denny's and he wanted to get some breakfast. He couldn't bring all his sheep with him into Denny's, right? So he would have to leave his sheep outside of town. Well, well you just leave them in the field and let them wander off? No, you put them in a sheepfold. And so they'd have these sheepfolds. And in the sheepfold would be sheep from all different shepherds. And you just kind of drop them, kind of like, you know, dropping your car off with the valet or whatever. You just like go in and like, here, okay, put your sheep in there. Here's your ticket. Come back and get them when you're leaving, right? Well, how do, how do your sheep not get mixed up with all the other sheep? Because your sheep know you. <coughs> they know your voice. Not only that, the gatekeeper knows you. He knows you're a shepherd. You drop the sheep off, right? Anybody else who's trying to go in there and get sheep, they have to dig under the fence. They have to hop over the fence. They have to find another way in. And if they're trying to come in a different way besides the front door, that means what? It means the gatekeeper doesn't know them, and they can't call their sheep out because they're not their sheep. So they have to go in another way to try to steal the sheep. That's why he calls them thieves and robbers. Shepherds have a unique way of calling their sheep, and every shepherd had a, 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 a different way. So whether it be whistles or yells or screams or some sort of, you know, special hand signs that only the sheep understood, right, they had a special way of, of communicating with their sheep. So when he would come, after he would drop his sheep off, when he would come back to get his sheep, the gatekeeper would open the door, the gatekeeper would open the door, and the shepherd, notice, he, who's, <laughs> someone's phone's ringing, um, is that Essence's thing or something? Right. So he would open the door, but you notice the shepherd did not go in and get his sheep out. He called his sheep out. Right. So, and they came out because they recognized his voice. This is what it says. Right? The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Notice he leads them out. There's a difference, right? He's leading. He's not driving. If you were to get into the sheep pen and be like, get out, all you sheep now, right? And they all are scared and they run out the front door. He's driving his sheep out, but he's leading his sheep out. He's standing outside the gate and he's saying, here, sheepy, sheepy, right? Come on. And all his sheep who recognize him know his voice because he know his special call, right? Whatever it was. Woohoo! Hey, sheep, right? Hey, dad's here, right? And they all come flying, running out of the sheepfold. And he calls his sheep. They know his name. They know him. He knows them. They know him. They come out when he calls. And then he leads them out. He goes before them and they follow him because they know he's the shepherd. They're not going to do that for a stranger. That's why the strangers have to try to get in a different way to steal the sheep. They can't do it through the front door. Only the true shepherd <coughs> enters by the front door. The gatekeeper knows him. The sheep knows him. They know his unique call. They know his unique yell. And when he calls, they come a-running, and they follow him. He leads them. Right? He doesn't follow them. They follow him. He leads them. <coughs> Bonus application for you. Right? Sheep are led. They are not driven. <coughs> Why do I tell you this? Because you're like, I'm not a shepherd. Yes, you are. You're a sheep and a shepherd. Look behind you. Who's following you? There's only one time that you usually see sheep driven. And when I say sheep are driven, I mean you don't call them an Uber. Right? That's not what we're talking about. Call the sheep Uber. No, they're not being driven that way. The uh, only one time you see sheep being driven, generally speaking. Right? Because when you're driving sheep, what are you doing? You're getting behind them. 
You're moving them by force. You're smacking, kicking, yelling, whatever it takes to, to get them to move. The only time that you she see sheep being driven usually is when the butcher, not the shepherd, right, a stranger basically, is taking them to the slaughterhouse to be killed. That's generally the only time you see sheep being driven. Because they don't know him. That's a stranger. They won't follow him to the slaughterhouse. He has to drive them to the slaughterhouse. He has to kick them and smack them and yell at them. It all has a purpose. It's to confuse them. It's to shock them. It's to scare them into submission so they won't fight back. That's the purpose. That's driving sheep. But the shepherd doesn't do that. The shepherd calls them. And they come out. And they follow him as he leads them. All right. I tell you this because in Acts 20, it tells us to pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Paul is telling this to the church leaders in Ephesus. But it applies because, as I said, we're all sheep, but we're also shepherds. Because every one of us, at one point in time, had someone we were leading or someone who was following us. And today, you might think, my kids are all moved and out of the house. I don't have anybody. No, you do. You have grandkids and great-grandkids and neighbors and Someone that you're shepherding. Husbands are shepherding their families. Parents are shepherding their kids. Grandparents are shepherding their grandkids. It's not just applicable to pastors and overseers and elders and leaders in the church. It's applicable to you. Your flock is your family. So pay attention, be alert. Care for them. Be on the lookout for wolves. Use the rod and staff when necessary. But lead them. Don't drive them. When you have to choose, because you're going to have to make this choice, if you haven't already had to make this choice once in your life, when you have to choose between that frustration and anger or love and grace, right? that's a choice between leading and driving. When you have to choose to make that choice, choose love. Be kinder, be flexible, be more gracious than ever. Right? Quit shouldering that weight and the burdens and the expectations that you think are on you, that may possibly have been placed on you by the world. Lead your sheep. Comfort your sheep. Point them to the good shepherd, Jesus. Every shepherd has a unique call. Every shepherd has a unique way of calling their sheep. The more time you spend with your kids, with your grandkids, with your family, with those you're shepherding, the more they'll recognize your voice. The more they'll realize and follow you because they'll know what you're saying is true because you're pointing them to the good shepherd, Jesus. Shepherds won't follow strangers. Sheep won't follow strangers. This, like I said, which is why they have to climb in the pen another way, because they can't enter through the door. So be a good shepherd. Lead your flock. Don't drive them. At the end of the chapter here, they are talking about what Jesus said, and they said, these were not the words of one who was oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? They're referring to what Jesus had just done, which he would heal the blind man. Well, that blind man, remember... He was blind. He couldn't see Jesus. He heard Jesus. So in a sense, Jesus called him, and he heard his voice. And he said, I'm following that. <clears throat> he knew Jesus' voice, and he followed Jesus. We look at this, and we can see the pictures. Jesus tells them this, and the Jews, they didn't understand. I, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, but, you know, Hindsight's twenty twenty, But it tells us in verse 6, this figure of speech that Jesus used with them, they didn't understand. They didn't understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus says it again. But he kind of, you know, changes up the wording slightly. He's still saying the same thing. So he says it again. He's repeating the same thing. And here is really where he discusses his qualifications for being the good shepherd because here you, he gives us two I am statements. And he first says, I am the door of the sheep, in verse 7. And then he says, I am the good shepherd, in verse 11. 
I am the door of the sheep, of course, has to do more about when shepherds were out in the field with the sheep. Because like I said, they didn't have a portable pen to carry around to herd their sheep into for protection at night or things like that. So they would find the spot. They would find a good place that they could, if needed to, that they could herd their flock into for safety, like a little alcove or maybe a cave or something like that where they could be in and be safe and nothing could come and attack them. But of course, these places didn't have doors. So who would be the door? The shepherd would be the door. Right? The shepherd would stand there. The shepherd would lay there. The shepherd would lay across the opening. It usually would have a narrow opening. Narrow is the way. And the shepherd would lay across it. He became the door. That's where he would sit. That's where he would sleep. If a sheep wanted to you know, get in, they would have to go over the shepherd. If they wanted to get out, they'd have to go over the shepherd. There was only one way in and out to the flock, and that was through the shepherd, through the door. He was the door. Jesus says, I am the door. There's only one way into this pasture. There's only one way, right, and it's through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way. It's through Jesus. He is the door. He says, I am the door, verse 9. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said, there's only one way into good pasture. There's only one way for salvation. There's only one way to be saved. It's through me. And if anyone is leading you or is saying they're leading you, but they're not leading you to me, and it has nothing to do with me, and it's not going through Jesus in any way, then those people went into the pasture. They went in to the sheepfold. They went in the wrong way. They climbed over. They dug under. They cut a hole through the fence. Whatever. It doesn't matter. They snuck in, and they didn't come in the right way. They didn't go through Jesus. There's only one way. It's through the door. I am the door. Salvation only comes through Jesus. Anybody else who comes in any other way, they're, only, they're, they're, they're thieves, and they only have one desire, which is to steal, kill, and destroy First Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus is saying, listen, <clears throat> there are wolves in sheep's clothing. But not just that, there are wolves in shepherd's clothing. Just this, I think it was just this last week, Mike Winger He's a pastor online. He does a little YouTube, uh, has a YouTube channel. He would put out a four-hour expose on Benny Hinn. And a lot of people think, Benny Hinn, he's all washed up and old. and He's not relevant anymore, is he? Remember, not too long ago, he was right here, right? Another church in town brought him in for Easter and another thing afterwards. In Africa, he brings in hundreds of thousands of people to come see him blaspheme the word of God. So it's not just wolves in sheep's clothing, it's wolves in shepherd's clothing. Their intentions are not good. They will lead you astray. They will devour you. And the, re the reason why Jesus is given these warnings is because Jesus knows that we're sheep and he knows generally sheep are defenseless. Sheep aren't really good you know, at defending themselves per se, except for the very rare occasion <laughs> where they're headbutting the shepherd, right? Like what we saw in that video there. Generally, they're thought of as defenseless. I mean, many animals have a way of defending themselves. Horses can kick really hard, right? Dogs and animals like that can bite and attack you. Cats, they got claws. You step, you know, your cat can go up and down you faster than you can blink and rip you to shreds, right? But all the sheep really have, despite the one head-butting one, all they really have is the, <laughs> right? Which generally doesn't scare anybody away. They don't have a menacing growl, you know? If you have the wolf that comes up to eat the sheep and the sheep goes, bah, the, the wolf doesn't go, oh, 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 that's so cute, right? No, he just eats them. They don't really scare anybody. They're generally defenseless. Specifically when they're cut off from the rest of the flock. 
when predators attack, when thieves come, when they can't defend themselves. But the hope is this. It's Jesus. Because Jesus isn't just the door of the sheep. He's also the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd is there to defend his flock. One of the best pictures I saw, I didn't bring it with me, but when I was looking for images to use uh, for today was a, a picture of a wolf getting ready to attack a sheep. And right between the two, you see running over the hill with its staff in hand, ready to you know, take out that wolf with one swing was Jesus. Jesus is willing to, he laid down his life for the sheep. Jesus said, this is the qualifications of a good shepherd, right? They lay down their life for the sheep. Jesus says, I have the authority to lay down my life. I give it freely. I'm laying down my life for the sheep. I have the authority to lay it down and pick it back up again. I am the good shepherd, right? That's the ultimate qualification for a good shepherd. The rest are just fake shepherds. They're just hired hands. They're not really even shepherds at all because as Jesus said and as we went over, he said, listen, when trouble comes, what do they do? They run. They're not really worried. They're not worried. They don't want to protect you. They have, no re- they don't have no reason to protect you. They're just looking out for themselves. They don't care for the sheep at all. They will just abandon you. Zechariah eleven seventeen says, Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered and his right eye utterly blinded. Listen, Jesus isn't going to abandon you. He's not going to run away when trouble comes. He doesn't do this. He didn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. He came so that you would have life and you would have life abundantly. Right? Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Jesus will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Jesus is, as it tells us in Hebrew 13, the great shepherd of the sheep. He protects his sheep. He knows them by name. He calls them out. They follow him. So the good, bad, and ugly of everything that we've been going over here in these verses is real simple. We live in a world that's full of false teachers, and we live in a world that's full of false leaders, and we live in a world where a lot of people claim to be shepherds, quote, unquote, but yet don't have a clue about leading the flock because they're trying to drive the flock and not lead it. They want to scare you into moving. They want to scare you into doing things. They got to get behind you and yell at you and scream at you and push or or try to, in some other way, get you to move, to do what they want you to do, because you just won't do it willingly. If they just said, hey, come follow me, you'd be like, I don't know who you are. Why would I follow you? So they got to do it another way. And Jesus is telling you those type of people aren't shepherds at all. And the reason you don't follow them, unless somehow you're forced into it, or coerced into it, or they put your arm behind your back and push you forward and make you do it, The reason you wouldn't follow them just on your own is because you know that they're not shepherds. You you know, you don't know their voice. They're strangers. There's only one good shepherd, and that's Jesus. These people, they're just hirelings. They just punch in and they punch out. They're on the clock, and they aren't really worried about anything anything else, right? They, they, They will abandon you in a second to save their own skin. They don't care about you. They'll leave you high and dry. They're going to let you walk off a cliff where they're having breakfast and they won't even, you know, lose sleep over it. Those false leaders and those false teachers, much like these religious leaders that Jesus is addressing here, right? they're not shepherds. They're not leaders. That's the ugly truth of it. They've only come to steal, kill, and destroy, which is why we don't follow them, which is why we only follow Jesus, which is why we obey God and not man. And the good news of it all is this. It's Jesus. Right? You want good pasture? You want salvation? You want peace? You want comfort and security? Guess what? It comes through Jesus. He's the door. He's the good shepherd. Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. Jesus came to give us life and to give it abundantly. Jesus knows his sheep and we know him. He knows, we know his voice. He knows us by name. When Jesus calls, we listen. When he says, come on out, we go out. He leads, we follow. He doesn't drive us. He leads us. And we have comfort and we have peace and we have, you know, security and understanding that he goes before us. 
Right? That's exactly what it says here. He goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. We trust Jesus and we follow him because we know that's who we're following. That's the good news. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the door. We follow Jesus and in Jesus we are saved. He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. Amen? Let's end by reading this. Psalms 23 verses 1 through 6. You guys should have this one memorized. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your words, and I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are a good shepherd, and I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you lead and we follow because we understand who you are and what you've done and the price that you paid for our salvation. We understand that you laid down your life for the sheep. We understand that you won't abandon us. You won't forsake us. You won't run when danger comes. You stand in front of us. And we thank you, Lord, for the comfort and the peace and the security that comes from that. We thank you, Lord, that you are the great I am. And we pray, Lord, that we can continue to be a light in the darkness and we can continue to point people to you, the good shepherd. We can continue to point the lost sheep to the one shepherd who actually cares for them and who wants to bring them into his fold. He wants to love them and doesn't want them wandering alone and lost. We thank you for this. We thank you for your word. We pray you be with all who are here and all who couldn't make it. All who aren't feeling well, we pray for Perla that she will improve and keep Ed safe when Perla is sick. Pray for your hand, for healing over that. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Jana, do you want to bring up your daughters? We're going to pray for Jana and her daughters. If I can have Dad, if you can come up. Um, and whoever else would like to come up as well. They're getting ready to go um, to Texas, Houston, right? For the what? The World Finals? I don't know what it's called, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> it's the World Championship of Robotics. And uh, their team has been a great example to a lot of the other teams that are um, competing and uh, because of your guys' faith in God and an example that your team is to a lot of the other teams. And I hear last week, you guys, it was a miracle, you know? God brought you from behind and uh, you won, or whatever it was. And you get to go to Houston, so it's great. So we want to pray over you guys or your family. I know Eddie is working or sleeping maybe at this point, but uh, as he was working all night. But um, we'll pray for safe trips and uh, and great competition, you know, Lord's will be done. You guys are a great example regardless if you win or lose, and you guys know that. So that's part of the great testimony that you guys have and, and what you're sharing with all the other kids. So let's pray. <coughs> Lord, I just thank you for the Labinia family here, and they're, they're heading off to Houston for a great robotics uh, uh, tournament. We pray, Lord, for safe travels, number one. Uh, that everything goes smoothly. They all get down there without any problems. There's no hiccups in the flights and, and the arrangements. Um, everyone stays healthy. It'll be a great trip for the family and that everyone enjoys themselves. Uh, we pray for the whole team, everyone that's going down, uh, that, uh, that for all their safety. Uh, but we also pray they just continue to be a great example uh, to all the others who don't believe in Jesus, who aren't following the Lord. They can see a team here who professes their faith, follows the Lord, 
and are uh, a great testimony and a, sh a light shining because of that. Regardless if they win or they lose, or it's discouraging, you know, when loss happens, but uh, there are great things that come from it as well. But we just pray, Lord, that they do the best that they can do and that your will be done. We just pray that they have a great time and that they're a great example and bring them home uh, safe. We just thank you, Lord, for this and just bless their entire trip in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs>